Welcome to Powering Conversations, the interview series where we delve into the lives of some fantastic local characters. Today, we are in an old East Belfast spinning mill. Walking around, you can almost hear the echoes of the past. This is the perfect location for today's three guests who will share their powerful old but gold stories on craft, creativity and their lives. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a glass of powers and enjoy some spirited conversations. Hello and welcome to the third episode of Powering Conversations. I'm Ronan Collins and today we will be delving into the themes of art and creativity. dance was brilliant. Thank you. I tried to move along, but it didn't really. It didn't work. No, it didn't. No, no but we felt your empathy. Yes, from afar, <laughs> which is good. You just created it in this space today. I think this is such an incredible space. The view outside, the cranes, the light, the architecture. So that was really inspiring for us. So we decided just to take three different sections of the space and work with that to sort of emphasize it and the human bodies in between. Yeah, there was something about the strength that we were getting from the space and the vastness. So we were sensing to work with our weight into the ground, but also with each other. So there's a lot of push and pull. And we felt that really reflected the industry that had gone on in this building. The piece that I really felt was working for me was working with the strong hosts and really pushing and pulling and the weight of each other through them. Yeah, and you could definitely definitely see that, almost like the exchange of energy and yes. movement between the two of you. Yeah. And the support, really, Ronan, as well, because we were talking earlier, you know, having the shipbuilding here as part of Belfast and the paintings are often about the men, but we also wanted to just think about women and what their industry all during that time and that feeling of supporting one another and and the hard graft of it. Yeah, because yeah. this was a spinning mill yeah. that we're in. So I'm sure the women were working so hard in this space. But also we thought about the support of women behind the men mm -hmm. who built these amazing ships. Yeah. You can definitely see all that come to life in your movement, which must be a big part of what you do day to day in each piece, bringing something to life and storytelling as well. Yes, yeah, right. exactly. absolutely. We also liked the idea of looking out through the windows because we were thinking about the whole thing of reflection, looking back, obviously ourselves being mature dancers. We have a wealth of experience, lifetime experience of dancing. And we were talking about how much our sense of dance has changed over the years and the richness of what we experience now with each other and how we improvise and work with each other together. It was really lovely looking out that window because it was looking back, you know, as Sandy was saying, all your history. And I just remembered last night that my mother worked in the shipyard. She was a secretary in it. She really enjoyed that job. And then she got married. Of course, at that time, women didn't really work after they got married. You know, I was able to think about her and think about that, that past. So I feel that this this has been all around us today, hasn't it, Sandy? Yeah. You know, absolutely. Yeah. For myself, I originate from the northeast of England, but I was born on Tyneside, and a lot of my ancestors worked in boat building, sail making, coast guard. So there's that real connection with the industry and the sea. So, yeah. It was like a living history in this room. And where did it all start, or how did you go down the path of professional dancing? I just was. I, a young person who had so much energy and very, very agile, just loved to, to be moving, to be dancing, you know, part of the dance club at school. I went actually down the gymnastic route. So I sort of worked as a national gymnast, I was in the British squad. And while I was doing the gymnastics, it was the real interest of the creativity. And I did my first contemporary dance class at the age of 17. 
and it was Eureka, this is it. This is what I need to do. Wasn't too sure how long I might do that, but now I'm in my 60s and I'm still doing it. And it's just, it's just my life. It's part of me. I just, you know, from the head to the toe, I am that dancer. And you can even get those vibrations off you that you just love everything that you do. Yeah. My parents were involved with the Lyric Theatre when it was really small. And as a child, that's where I spent my childhood, was sitting, watching them rehearse. So my sense of theatre was right through my life. And then I went to Helen Lewis, who was involved with the Lyric Theatre at that time. And I did creative dance classes with her. And that was me just completely wrapped up in performing dance that had something to say, that had meaning. I continued to dance, create, be an advocate for dance in the community as well as for professional dancers. And I've played many different roles, but it is so fantastic to come back to this stage in my life and just feel like that child again, exploring and finding you know joy in the immediate and I think that's what we were doing today it's just being in the moment and there's so few times in life when you can really be like that in the moment you're not thinking about oh it's not perfect or you know you know you're thinking about the outcome but not just in the moment there's something about working now as a an older mature dancer where we sort of come back to working professionally with choreographers but there's something about the trust in your own body and the potential of that body and how you work with it and how you work with each other as well there's something really enriching when you're listening you're really listening to your body and obviously the environment that you're working in it's very special I think it's fair to say that contemporary dance was usually the forte of the younger dancer, you know, mm. because it's about physical capacity and their artistic expression, and that is to be treasured. And so it's only recently that the ability of the mature performer to bring something else to mm. it has been recognized, but that is definitely happening across the UK, I would mm. say, Sandy, wouldn't mm. you? You know, yes. which is great for us, just hitting it at the right time, you know. <laughs> when I look back at my career, you never knew what was next. Would you have the job? Would you have, you know, what? Mm. Because there was no pathway. Whereas I feel like every now and again, I've just sort of stepped over a big gap. You know, oh, I'm now doing this, this, this. And, I, and that, is, that is really marvelous, actually. So wouldn't you say there was no career path? Yeah, there's like a lot that. more pathways. And, and now there's pathways. I would never have thought five years ago, never mind, 20 years ago, that I'd be still, mm -hmm. you know, leaping about, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, and there's something wonderful about all the students that I sort of nurtured and mentored and have gone on to train and gone on to dance, have gone on to be very well-known choreographers. So there's, there's that lovely understanding that you are passing on your skills, but also inspiring others. And I hope ourselves as dancers at this age, we're inspiring others to dance well into their 80s. So you mentioned doing quite a lot of giving back and coaching and lecturing. You have the Belfast Movement Choir. Yes. Tell me about that. We work together on a project that is uh, for intergenerational women. You know, we would have our 20-year-olds, our 30-year-olds, but we also, within one group, we have 70 and 80-year-olds, and they're still moving and expressing. It's just wonderful to see these amazing ladies mm -hmm. still dancing well into their 80s. It's been a project that was in the pipeline for quite a while. I was, at the time, working with Maiden Voyage Dance. We just had this idea that we'd try and in Belfast really connect to different communities. So we had a group in the north, the south, the east and the west and we've been developing this. Jane and I were both facilitating these different groups and then last year we were able to bring the four groups together. Due to COVID we decided we'd do a film and we actually performed the piece and it was called Reemergence. so it was the whole idea of how we felt you know within COVID and maybe not being able to connect to each other and this feeling of re-emerging and reconnecting. You've almost went full circle from when you started dancing the play element to now you're back to that. And it's almost like you understand the box so much that you can think outside of it, but yes. go back into it and yes. thus, I suppose, curate your own dances on the spot. Yes. Which must be more freeing yes. than ever. 
I think that's absolutely right, Ronan, in that also it opens up spaces for you to move in because if you're not prepared to do that, it's a bit hard to go into a park and say, right, we're going to come and it's just move. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? But you can be inspired by the place that you're in and that becomes part of the whole identity mm. of the dance that you're doing and the people feel comfortable. So at the moment, Sandy runs a somatic practice once a month on a Saturday and that's all outdoors in the parks and it's mm -hmm. been fantastic. Yeah. And that's for Maiden Voyage as well. And Introducing people just to being outside and going, it's all right, you know, just <laughs> to really be with yourself in this gorgeous space and have a little bit of, you know, playtime. Nobody's judging, nobody's watching, nobody's, and they're not watching. I can tell you that. I mean, we were in the park and sometimes I'd be thinking, they're all going to stop and they're going to go, and they just walk straight past you, through you sometimes, yeah. and you're going, you know. They, they, they're intrigued, <laughs> they're intrigued and they're interested. And sometimes people will ask a few questions, oh, what are you up to there? But then they'll just carry on walking through with their dog. And, <laughs> and it just becomes a part of the park and nobody pays and any attention to it. And it's lovely. And I think that way of having art and life and all together in the one place, yeah. And us sort of breaking down some of those boundaries is, yeah. is lovely. It's, it's like that, a bit of a pop-up, you know. And it's that connection to, to nature coming out of COVID again. There has been so much about, you know, health and well-being and making sure you are connecting to nature. There's nothing better than connecting to nature, but also yeah. moving. <laughs> you both recently <laughs> just filmed a duet <laughs> together called yep. Epilogue. What was that like? Tell us a bit about that. Epilogue grew out of a research project we had started the year before with I McClory, the choreographer, and it was about the movement potential of mature performers to communicate a lived experience. And we were looking at the visible and invisible aspects of aging in a dancer. And following that research project, we then were involved in Epilogue, and it became then a cross art form project between music, dance, poetry, and film. But you started rehearsing that in COVID. How does one dance together when you're social distancing? We did quite a lot on Zoom for a while, you know, just meetings, getting a sense of what things will be. But our first venture into moving together and connecting actually was in Lady Dixon Park. Yep. <laughs> so we sort of developed different ideas, themes around as a mature dancer, how you reflect on your dance career, what it entails, how our bodies feel now as older dancers in relation to our younger selves. The quote for that movie was the dancer dies twice. Yes. What does that actually mean in the life of a well, dancer? I think it means that when you give up performing, it's like I was saying earlier, that's a big moment because until quite recently, there probably was not much else you could do. One of the things that certainly dance has always given me is that sense of hope and identity, friendship, companionship, resilience, you know, those sorts of things. But it can be a bit of a full stop and that stops. Perhaps overall, it's that thing of aging. We don't see older women very often, you know, so it was quite bare and you don't see older women really dancing. And we wanted to give that message you can come back, you, no matter what happens, even if you leave dance or like, you come back and you can integrate it back into your life and be visible again, and move in your body and feel comfortable in your body as an older woman, rather than feeling that it, you don't want to show it anymore or you don't, you know, you just don't want to be present in it because you're tired. I think being older is a new stage of life and it's so important not to see it as things shutting down but it's the beginning of something else and I don't know what it is, but there's a certain excitement in it rather than a, a closing, as I say, or an end of something. You know, the past is the past and dance, I think, has given me that feeling of the future holding just possibilities of discovery and knowing that every time I go into a studio, I'm not looking for something outside myself. I'm just in myself, in that place, with whoever I'm with. Mm. And that's all that's important. Yeah. Something about yeah. being Joy. being in the present, yeah. you know, really sensing where you are right at that moment and really savouring and, and getting joy from yeah. the movement and whatever you may be experiencing or working with yeah. at the time. Knowing what your body needs right 
at that present moment. So it's something about deep listening and moving with that understanding. Play. 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 Get that music on. Play. (laughs) So even for those who aren't choreographed dancers or taught dancers, the movement and the play is kind of vital. It's essential. Yeah. It's giving yourself permission. And I think a lot of the time as we move through our lives and we have so many responsibilities, we get to that point where we sometimes forget about who we are and how we can give ourselves permission to really move and enjoy the movement of our body and and celebrate our own bodies and what what they can do. If you could give your younger dance self, a bit of advice, what would that be? It's going to be all right. Don't look down. And be open to all possibilities. You know, life's not a straight line. You can go this way, this way, and you pick up on the way, and you you still go there. Uh, So I, I would, I feel that optimism. There's no walls, you just walk around them. Find a way around them. I think mine would be not to be so hard on yourself. I think as dancers, because you're working to perfect what you can do with your body as an instrument, we put so much pressure on ourselves. And I think as an older self, I would look back and say, yes, you want to do the best you can, but it's to savor each moment, enjoy each moment for what it offers and gives, and just let go, just be a little bit more relaxed about it all. Gosh, Sandy, that's really important because you're only as good as your last performance, really. And that's what you are in your career early on. It's always next. Can I do it again? Can I, will it be as good? And you don't take that pleasure. Mm-hmm. Or, and go the moment, this, yeah. you know, real celebration of what you've in just done. Moment. Yeah, just in the moment. really, really savour yeah. what you, these experiences offer you and uh, be joyful and, and, and love what you do, you know, every moment. Yeah. Welcome back to part two of Powering Conversations. Now, whilst we have been chatting, there's been something amazing going on off camera. Local artist Stephen Wally has been doing a landscape out of the window. Now, Stephen's going to join us and tell us more about it. So what have you been painting or what have you been up to? I paint landscapes for a living. Being here set in Belfast, I was looking at a different perspective on Belfast. I started painting an oil, looking back down the lock towards Belfast centre. So I put plenty of colour in it and it came together quite nicely. So. It's quite fun having so many different creatives now because your creative process might be slightly different. During the conversation, did you hear anything that maybe you like, I do that as well, you know? <laughs> I think just obviously, the, you know, that word serendipity. I really yeah. love the fact that, you know, some things you, when you're doing it just all of a sudden happen, and especially in dance and, and art itself, small sort of happy accidents and make yeah. something even better. I think we all love what we're doing, we love our craft, and the more you do it, the better you get. So, <laughs> From like a dance perspective, have you ever been inspired to move via art or incorporate that? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I think it's hardly a time I would ever go through an art gallery where I, I wouldn't actually go, that's a piece should be made out of that. Very inspiring. It's the movement in the picture that's really captivating. Yeah. I did a film in the past with the National Dance Company of Wales. It was based on the idea that it was a gallery and the different pictures came to life. Yes, nice. so we did that. And I'll just drop in, I did the costume for it and I won a BAFTA for the costume design. Just thought I'd drop that one in. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations for that. <laughs> so, Stephen, out this window, we've got the shipyards, which has a family connection to you also. My father, actually, was a plater. I uh, worked in the shipyard, actually, for 45 years. Uh, for his sins, when he was a wee boy, he was one of the guys that went out and marked out all the big pieces of metal, basically, to get, to get strapped on the side of making ships. So he went out at seven in the morning, came home at four, got washed and settled down. Then he was back up and back into work again. He'd he done that for 45 years, which is quite a feat, to be honest. So back then it was obviously a grueling sort of job for everyone. But he got through it and quite an inspiration to me as far as the work ethos sort of goes, you know. 
but it's nice having the shipyard right there. It's nice being from Belfast, as I'm reminded by it every time I, I go past it. It's just lovely. And my granddad as well, he was also a Belfast man. He's actually an old strong man, believe it or not. He worked on the buses and the trolley buses he drove around Belfast for years. He used to uh, do lots of feats of strength and lift trolley bus wheels above his head and, <laughs> and bags of cement you know, off the ground, all that sort of thing. So yeah, quite an inspiring sort of family, you know. We spoke earlier about like infrastructure that this building has and the living history of Belfast. Does that inspire some of your work also? Yeah, I think that whole nostalgia thing as well, you know, especially my paintings with, with the landscape. It's always been about, you know, somebody has a connection with something. And again, people in Belfast always have a connection to something, oh. whether it's somebody around the corner that somebody knows. You know, having that nostalgic sort of thing about my paintings, it, you know, it could be somewhere where you've walked with somebody or somebody maybe that used to be here and you used to go to a certain place. I think everyone in Belfast is very, very like that. Family is at home type of thing. Mm. Uh, again, a lot of sort of pictures of the North Coast coming down the coast, Cushion Doll, Cushion Dunn, Donnega Dee there, down the actually where Hollywood and stuff is, so I, I would paint there quite a lot. Now you mentioned nostalgia and connection. We're here with Powers. We have a couple of glasses of Powers on the table. But your granddad, you actually have his bottles. Yes. <laughs> we were helping him clear his house recently. He's coming on 90 years old now, and people used to give him bottles mm -hmm. of drink at Christmas because they thought he drank, but he, he never drank his whole life. I remember when I was a wee small boy, I sort of always seen the odd bottles sort of sitting around, and those bottles I brought with me today. I had this amazing way of dating things, and that was just by writing on them. This one here in particular, this is, again, quite a bit of history here. If you look at here, he actually wrote 1955 on the, on the top of this one. It's been quite a good sort of way of actually knowing what date it was actually produced or when, when it was here. And then you see the slightly larger one then. This one's actually in 1962 then as well. So these are part of like a collection of certain bottles of whiskey that I've, that I've kept. <laughs> Which is amazing because you can also see these bottles in the Powers Distillery down in Middleton but it's like classified as a museum because that's how rare these are. Yes. So thanks for bringing them along. Yeah, I just thought it'd be quite quite a good thing to show everyone, especially because it's to do with powers. I'm really in the graphics work as well, mm. being an artist. So you'll see even the way the bottles have sort of changed, but it hasn't changed that much, which I actually quite like. I've still got obviously the diamond logo there and it's quite nice that it hasn't changed too much. Yeah. Mm. And I love that whole historical element <laughs> of it. So we are gonna go and have a wee look at your painting and we're gonna say goodbye to our fantastic guests that we've just had. Sorry, we can't all just chat all day long <laughs> as much as I would love to. So, Sandy and Jane, before you leave, we'll just cheers oh, to a great oh, conversation. Cheers, absolutely. Cheers. And Stephen, we'll go and look at your painting. <laughs> yeah, cheers. cheers. So, Stephen, talk us through this piece that you've been doing off camera for the past while. My work is all about the colour, really. Obviously, I love painting Belfast from where I'm from, but I always like to look at different vantage points of where it can be from, because now and again, if we paint so much of the cranes, you know, you've got to do something slightly different. <laughs> so I do sort of venture up around sort of Jordanstown direction and over the other side there from, from Hollywood, sort of looking back at Belfast too, because you've still got that lovely skyline there with the cranes in it. So again, along that sort of lock shore, I've just sort of added a wee bit more of the colour and reeds and wispy sort of bits of grass here, but it's all about the colour and that vibrancy. And again, just in this horizon, I'm just about to put in just a wee bit of the cranes in the background of it. And then when it comes to your tools, I take it, do you use a brush? Yeah, well, I, I use diff different sizes, obviously, of brushes. I love doing skies. That's what being one of my things. I love sort of blending the colours and, and, and making up the skies as I go along. Most of the time, this one's been painted, obviously, on location here. But my own studio, there's working on around 40 paintings at once. While everything's sort of drying in certain stages, I'll lift it back down again and then add another layer on top of it until I sort of feel it's right. But again, at this one today, I've obviously added quite a lot of oil on it already. Mm -hmm. And then usually would let this dry and then go back over it again in certain areas to highlight things. But again, I use just basically a brush, different sizes of palette knives as well to give it texture. And again, just to make scrapes and marks in the canvas itself. And when you started this, did you take a snapshot and you're like, that's what I'm going to do? Or does the sky evolve as the you paint and you see the sky throughout the day? Yeah, it just evolves. So usually uh, I just layered a certain amount of colors and just work at it. And, and half the time it just comes from sort of within me, which nice. is a bit strange, but uh, that's the way it works. Yeah. Sometimes I do have points of reference or photographs, 
but a lot of the time I sort of just start off and I start painting and it, and it just evolves as it goes along. And you can so. see the atmosphere in the sky coming through there. For me, that's the most evocative point mm -hmm. uh, of this, but work away, don't let yeah. me stop you. Yeah, so we're just going to add a little bit on the, on the horizon here. You'll see a lot of sort of buildings and different things here. And again, I'm just making marks as I'm going along. We're maybe just going to add a wee bit of yellow in here for the cranes. There's the cranes getting at it. Basically, as you go along, we're going to add different, different sort of points and just create some sort of scene there that you can see buildings or, or just something in the background. And again, it's just by making small marks with a brush that you'll start to see it coming together. And maybe just a wee bit of white. And we all have this little bit of red that you always see on the crane, just there. <laughs> and unless you're re really close, you'll not be able to see that, but it's just making those marks as you're going along, just to make sure that people can see a certain thing there. And, and on their own interpretation of it. Watching you do that and you explaining the, the concept and the vantage point, it's totally come to light and all you did was touch it a couple of times and it just shows how exact and your, your eye to it all was. Yes. It's absolutely. amazing. Like I know when it comes to whiskey, those layers of perfection build up over year after year and the complexity and it's very like this painting. Mm -hmm. You've just added more and more complexity every little touch and scrape and brush stroke so it's it's fascinating to watch you yeah, sure we'll sit down and have a yeah, yeah why not yeah <laughs> absolutely so while that's drying i take it you haven't just started painting you've been painting for a while have you one of the last show competition when i was five years old just literally p1 or p2 and from then i knew exactly what i wanted to do my whole life and that was to do something to do with art i've been fortunate enough that i've came through school and i've went to art college and sort of lived that dream as I went along. I actually was always good at making things with my hands. I actually used to be in the building trade. I started a building company uh, about 25 years ago. And I went on from that to open an art gallery years ago as well then, and sort of lived the dream as such yeah. that I've had. And again, then from that, then selling my own paintings and working in that sort of art industry, built it up where you know I've got lots of different sort of things as far as You'll see a bit of a pocket square in my pocket. This was actually a painting of mine then, that, which I've actually had produced onto a silk as a gift for people that come to Northern Ireland. So we've got George Best on this one. I um, love that. Every time you put it in your pocket, it looks different. So we've got lots of different things that I do and I produce all my art onto. And one of the, the most recent things is that I've been painting live in front of lots of people. I realized that when I was down in the studio, painting all my paintings, I was producing quite a lot of work. and. Fortunate enough, somebody sort of seen it, and I ended up working uh, at different gala events and painting on stage in front of everybody. And then at the end of it, if people would buy it and it would be auctioned off for charity. You've raised quite a bit of money for charity yeah. as well. Like that must be incredible to be able to link in all those things together. I've just went down that path and it's all happened quite naturally. It wasn't really planned as, as that at the start. So it's a lovely, lovely situation to be in that I get to show everybody my talent as such. Mm -hmm and people do get to see it because you'll find a lot of artists would be sort of hidden away in their studios or you know whereas i've been fortunate enough that people now get to see it and i get to know a lot of people at, at those dinners as well i've been at one actually recently i was in a place called porchester hall in uh, in london in bayswater i was actually painting for the duchess of Gloucester. I went down and had a chat with her during the dinner and she was fascinated by all the painting has technology changed like do you use any old tools or new tools, I, I don't really know. Um, How does that work? I, I, I used to love actually using different tools that normally an artist wouldn't use. I used to use a plastering float, you know, for my bigger pieces. Yeah. People used to say, oh, how do you paint the big paint? So I said, well, you used to use a big brush. So, uh, <laughs> so it's as simple as that, you know, and, and, but it's keeping that simplicity where it's, again, about the paint, about the, about the brushes. I think even when I was at art college, when I first went there and done the foundation degree, there was a paintings module. It was actually Neil Shawcross took me for it. And it inspired me to make marks on the canvas and talk about art itself and, and what it was about. Back then, I didn't really know or didn't know mm -hmm. how to really paint at that stage, but it inspired me with even the colour and stuff that he was sort of using himself. And it's led me to where I am today. So, Jane and Sandy did mention that when they were creating when they were younger, they found that it was almost quite a strict framework, but the older they've gotten, the more freedom they've had in their movement. Have you, did you find the same? In your process? I think back then you were sort of obviously having to do, stick to a certain thing. Once you were out of college, you had to find your own way. The way I don't was if, if there was a place that say I knew somebody had a house or I knew they went on holiday, well, you just painted that place and, and hopefully they bought it once they've seen it. <laughs> and it was the same just with the likes of the North Coast. All the people who was selling my work to were all from sort of Hollywood and Belfast. They always had a second home in, say, Port Ballantrae. So I always painted a lot of paintings at Port Ballantrae. 
And in fact, I was going to mention even my jacket. Yes, yeah. please mention your jacket. <laughs> so uh, this is actually a, a, a picture of poor Pavel Trey. I actually had produced and put into an actual one of my jackets. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's under the silk, the same as the, the pockets, so the same silk as the pocket squares. It always made, made people remember me. If I was going to go away somewhere or you got a flash of something inside it and it was something to talk about, really, you know. It shows the artistic, creative blood that's running through you. Mm -hmm. So outside the painting, you have the pocket squares, you have the most bougie jacket I've ever <laughs> seen. But you just love creating anything and everything. Yeah, and I knew what, it's also about passing it on to other people. I get a real sense of, not achievement, but I love teaching people how to do it as well. So we actually run different classes. My wife, Atito, is amazing with the children. She teaches about sort of 60 children every Saturday oh, wow. how, to, how to paint. And then we both also do a certain evening there where we teach the adults how to do it as well. What are they called? Just so I... Well, it's like a painting sit night, so they basically come along. Some of the drinks companies would sponsor some of the drink even to be out there and they tell their story. We'll maybe have to do a powers one, possibly, you know. Absolutely. So I could yeah. go along, have the powers, and maybe paint the cranes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so a bit of that, or, the, or even the bottle of powers, because oh, yeah. it is such a lovely thing, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I have also been told that in your studio you have a bar. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> Brilliant. That seems like the perfect work balance. <laughs> when I go down to paint at night, I would pour myself a, a, a pour, usually. Yeah. A bit of time to relax and mm. get into my painting as it goes along. I wouldn't say I'm falling out of the place every night, but it certainly helps with the get the creative juices flowing, you know? Yeah, I'd say so. Have you ever like, just don't really feel like painting or are you always ready to put paint to canvas. A lot of the time, quite a busy sort of lifestyle. And when everybody's gone to bed, I like to paint at night and go down and relax in my studio, which I built it actually during lockdown, the very first one there, a few years ago. And it's just a space for me to go and be creative, you know, which is lovely because you do need a space to do it all. Your wife being an artist as well, do you ever critique her work being like, I wouldn't have done that? Well, we both do. Oh, do you? <laughs> so, gee, yeah. And I think that's why it works, I think. Yeah. Because she would create, critique me and I would critique her. She would come up with an idea for me and I would come up for an idea with her. So it really does help having that. If they were in a different profession, I don't think they would get what I'm doing and I wouldn't get what they're doing. So Yeah. Is there any scene in Ireland that you've yet to paint? that you really want to? Yeah, well, I suppose there, there's certain places that we've been to in the Southern Ireland a bit and more in the Donegal. At, at the very start when I was doing the landscapes, I actually swapped the house for a, a painting to go down to uh, for a holiday, oh, basically. Right. And then during the night, there was a lovely studio that this American girl actually had that owned the house previous. And the guys basically let me the house for a couple of weeks and I went down and painted a whole series uh, of work from Donegal, it was in our draft, honestly. As I say, it was a lovely old stove, and, and I went out and took photographs during the day, and then painted at night. As I was leaving, I literally put a, a painting up on their wall of where it was, and that paid for the holiday, so uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Absolutely. Living art, I suppose, in Belfast, we see it almost every day, wherever we are, and we are famous for our murals, but you have taken a different spin on what we would know as murals, and you've brought your fantastic art to the walls. Lovely lady called Liz, she's a yoga teacher. She was opening a new place in Hollywood, and she approached me and asked me, could I do some sort of mural? She didn't know what it was going to be off. She knew it was possibly going to be one of my landscapes at the time, but she sent me all the colors that she wanted and she gave me the keys of the place. And she had a, a wall plastered. It was about 12 meters long, actually, in the yoga studio. Once it was all dry, I went down there for an evening and stayed there and done it from start to finish type of thing over the space of about 12 hours. So now they see hundreds of people every week practice their yoga in front of this mural. And that's just very calming and, and everything to the soul. So it's been great for people going down there with photographs and having that sort of calming influence, especially from some of my landscape work. It's actually been quite an achievement for me because so many people have enjoyed it, given that opportunity to actually produce it and to produce it well. It was brilliant, you know. Do you still get that same fulfillment from all your art? Because when you do it live, you must get instant gratification from people enjoying it every time. Yeah, I think even the pressure of it. I remember painting a gallery in Hollywood right in the centre at one point and had a, an arts night every year. Same one as the have in Belfast, where I sort of set up all my paintings in the window of the place. I just started painting and I, I remember turning around at one point, there was maybe a hundred people watching. And you know what, it actually put a bit of pressure on me, but it actually sort of made me want to produce it as best I could. Mm -hmm. Not that I hid away in my studio, but I was sort of doing it on my own and producing the work and putting it in the gallery. And then 
some VC media and said, you know, would you like to do this in front of crowds or in front of big, big sort of gala dinners? So then I started doing that and everyone seemed to love it. I actually get a real buzz from it now. So I get up there and people come up during the night even and, and love to watch it, it actually getting produced in front of their very eyes type of thing. You know, like a magic trick. As I go along, then I'll sort of time it and I'll, I've got better at sort of painting a wee bit faster and knowing what, knowing what to paint depending on the crowd that I'm going to as well. And, and maybe a place, you know, I, I painted one recently up in the Port Stewart Golf Club and you had this amazing setting out of a Port Stewart strand up there. So if we're just that, and again, everyone sort of loved it that it was on location. Mm-hmm. So you're not just painting the same thing over and over again, you know. That must be so special for those being there to watch this piece just unfold minute after minute before their eyes. Stephen, you mentioned that you and your wife are both artists. Does that mean your children are going to be the prodigies of Belfast when it comes to painting canvas? I think it's just how we go around about daily life because obviously my wife and I are, are painting or we're doing lots of artistic sort of things. Obviously our sons are watching it and, and getting inspired by it all. My eldest son, who's only 10 at the moment, you know, he's, he's been drawing all his life. And you know, I remember him doing like a drawing of like a football stadium years ago when he was like four years old, about the age I sort of started. And I just thought it was amazing. He's obviously got a wee bit of the creative genes in him. And my youngest one, again, he's only seven and he's got it as well, it seems, you know. So the both of them are obviously being inspired by us. And maybe it's something, maybe it, we can pass that on to other people. You know, it's not maybe not just all about academic sort of work. You involve a wee bit more art in the people's lives or when they're younger or even for older people that's maybe looking for something else to do and to calm them out or maybe to give them a wee bit of peace inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any of the classes that we do take, families do turn up and some of the classes are for actual families. So you know, a mum or dad will come along or and sit with their children and actually do it with them rather than just sort of sending them off to some class that they never see what they're doing. So you spoke about your granddad and his connection with powers and you brought those brilliant bottles along, your dad in the shipyard, yourself as the fantastic artist and then on to your kids. Those generations just seem to be getting more and more creative. What do you think about Northern Ireland being such a creative hub right now? Yeah, I think I think obviously with the creativeness being suppressed in everybody for so long, all of a sudden things have changed. People are moving back home again. People left years ago and they're coming back. Having that resilience certainly is one thing. I know I certainly have it. It can yeah. be, it's a bit cold in here today. And usually, you know, people have thick skin here as well. And there's always a bit of banter, a bit of crack from everybody. And that sort of helps. You know, everybody sort of sticks together as such as well here. Yeah. And it is that sort of home sort of village feel to Belfast and Northern Ireland itself that brings everybody back. You really tap into the bright, vibrant life that we have here. It's such a fantastic representation of Northern Ireland. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. It's been so good talking to you and we'll have a wee cheers to that one. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers, man. Thank you. And this painting behind us that is patiently drying, for anyone watching, you could be in for the chance to win it. Just keep an eye on the Powers Whiskey NI socials and, you know, you could be taking home this fantastic piece. I might bring you around to my house. Maybe you can do a live one of just me sitting there. (laughs) Paint me like a French girl, Jack. (laughs) Cut. <laughs> <laughs>